Hello. So we're going to continue our series on nuclear medicine bone scintigraphy now with a bit of an introduction to fractures and metastases, which are two of the common pathologies you'll encounter. So let's first of all just point out a few sites of normal uptake, and we'll continue to do this as we go through the various pictures. It's quite common to get a little bit of increased activity in the anterior aspect of the first ribs, as these areas are quite close to the gamma camera, and you can also see quite prominent uptake in the sternoclavicular joints as a normal finding, providing they're symmetrical. We mentioned the coracoid process, prominent activity here is normal, and prominent but symmetrical acromioclavicular joint activity is also normal. Now this area of activity here is a normal finding at the angle of Louis or manubriosternal articulation. That is a small central round area of discrete activity. And it's quite important to note that because we don't want to confuse it with fractures or with breast cancer metastases. And the sternum is very frequently involved in, I suppose it's local spread rather than metastatic disease, but tumor involvement from uh, adjacent breast cancers. Now in this picture here we're going to look at uh, two uh, important findings. First is cervical spine facet degenerative change which is very commonly seen and we have to recognize it so we can discount it as not being significant. So here's a classic example. We have these rather um, linear horizontal foci of activity uh, to the left and right of the midline well away from the center and this is the classic appearance of cervical facet degenerative change. Another uh, thing I'd like to draw your attention to here is this triangular shaped area of activity in the uh, lower neck on the anterior view. Now we mentioned before that uh, the technetium methylene diphosphonate uh, is the uh, tracer we use to perform the examination. During the chemical manufacture of this, we do expect for the we expect that the vast majority of technetium will be linked with methylene diphosphonate in order to, in order that the tracer we desire, the radiopharmaceutical we desire, will be produced. But of course, not all of the technetium will link with the um, methylene diphosphonate. It's not a perfect process, and a little is left behind as free protectinate, free technetium protectinate, or unbound technetium and that will be injected with our injection and it will pass to uh, principally to the thyroid gland so it's just a if you like a, a contaminant or a byproduct which we can see on the examination so it's nothing to worry about um, and the important thing is not to confuse it with anything else okay so with that in mind let's take a look at this next picture here this patient has a central focus of activity in the lower neck and it's um, not really the, the shape that we saw for the um, thyroid activity but it's not really lateral enough to be the facet degenerative um, change accumulation so we didn't want to miss a metastasis here so we performed a SPECT CT on the patient and I've just got the fused image here showing you the activity centrally in the neck and this is a sagittal reconstruction of the CT component of the SPECT CT and we can see that this is an area of degenerative change with osteophyte formation. So that's the explanation for this. It might cause the patient some discomfort but we don't have to worry that it's uh, a site of metastatic disease. Okay so back to the sternum you remember the uh, normal uptake was a small area of uh, activity at the manubriosternal articulation. It's not always seen, it's only sometimes seen. Um, but this area here is rather a, rather a different uh, appearance. It's a transverse band of activity. And this transverse band appearance is often seen in the sternum or the spine where we might have a fracture. So this patient actually had a um, un an ununited fracture of the sternum which was causing this appearance. Here's a patient who um, fell over at home and fractured their right uh, hip. We can see some activity here along the distribution of an intratrochanteric fracture line. And the patient had a bone centigram because there was concern from the team 
that the appearances of the fracture on the plane radiograph were malignant. Uh, they weren't, but um, so we probably shouldn't have done a bone centigram, but it happened anyway. So I just wanted to show this as the, um, this is the, the normal appearance of a fracture. It doesn't have to be malignant. Uh, we can't tell for sure, but this is the, this uptake here is in the pattern we would expect from an acute fracture. And in the past, when, um, uh, in the past, bone centigrams were used to um, evaluate patients who had normal plain radiographs, but a very high clinical index of suspicion for femoral neck fracture. Um, and it reveal, could reveal these with a high degree of sensitivity, but generally speaking, MRI is used for that purpose now, although we are occasionally still asked to perform it. The couple of things I wanted to show you here are this pattern here. This, uh, this activity here in two adjacent ribs is very, very commonly seen on bone syndrograms, and it's a classic traumatic pattern. Often the patient won't even remember the trauma, um, uh, it's a classic site for rib injury from trauma to the anterior chest wall. The other thing that makes us think that this is traumatic rather than metastatic is these two, two foci of activity are immediately next to each other, whereas we would expect metastases distributed through the blood to be a more uh, random phenomenon. You might be wondering what this is. Well, we did mention that the tracer was cleared through the urinary tract, this is just pelvic haloceal system activity here. And of course our bladder has been covered up with the region of interest as we spoke about before. Here's a patient who had a seat belt injury um, in a road traffic accident and hit their front of their chest as well. Uh, you can see a transverse band of activity here from a sternal fracture and again multiple foci of increased activity all in line. Of course the history will, will be very suggestive, but it would be most unusual for metastases to have this distribution. And of course, don't forget the patient may undergo a bone centigram for query metastases many months or perhaps a year or two after they've had their fractures, and they may not uh, they might, may not uh, give us a, a good history of the fractures, even though we ask them. So uh, we have to be alert to the fact that uh, occult fractures and activity from previous fractures may be present on the syntogram. Now of course the uh, spine is a very common site for benign wedge compression fractures and so we have to be alert to those. Um, it can be difficult to tell them from um, metastatic disease uh, but this, this is the classic appearance here, a transverse band of activity, a uh, quite smooth transverse band is often seen in a benign wedge compression fracture. This patient also has a knee replacement down here. We can see that photopenic defect like we did with the um, hip replacement in the uh, last talk. And we can see the thyroid activity and those prominent um, sternoclavicular joints. This is normal. This is not degenerative change. So here's a plain x-ray on this patient. And we can see that there's a wedge compression fracture here in the um, lower thoracic spine, corresponding to this. And we can see it here as well. Now, how long does a fracture show up in a bone centigram? Well, it's very difficult to say. Um, you can see patients who've had tibial fractures, which is a big thick bone, and you can see the activity on, the, on, on their scan from a fracture they had maybe 40 years ago, whereas rib fractures will often be invisible on a syntogram when, when you can see that the trauma was performed maybe two or three years ago. So it's quite variable. You can see this patient who's also had a wedge compression fracture demonstrates only very low grade activity here in the lower thoracic spine. And here's their CT scan showing the um, wedge compression fracture and there's some osteophyte formation indicating it's a long standing process. So now we're going to move into talk about metastases um, and uh, as well as fractures. And this patient has an example of both. So again, you can see this classic pattern where they've sustained trauma to their um, anterior ribs, three foci of activity together, which would be quite unusual for metastases. But you can also see some random foci of activity here in the pelvis and in the ribs.
these are more the sort of appearance we would expect with metastatic disease. There's a focus here. Now this is not quite like the degenerative um, facet joint activity we saw earlier, and this is highly suspicious for an additional site of metastatic disease. Nowadays we always um, like uh, to try and get some kind of confirmation, especially if we have SPECT-CT available, to make sure we're uh, diagnosing metastases correctly because it usually has a very big consequence for the patient's management. So well, we performed a SPECT-CT in this patient and you can see the classic appearances of a rib fracture here with some callus formation around it. And here, if we just uh, go back, I'll show you. Um, here's the rib activity from the fractures. And then this focus here, which we were very concerned about, shows diffuse sclerotic change on the CT component in keeping with metastatic disease, quite irregular. Okay, here we have um, a patient with a rather linear focus of increased activity here and another one here. This is quite faint, but there is a small area of uptake here. Here's the SPECT component of a SPECT-CT examination. Here's the CT component showing us dense sclerosis, which is common in osteoblastic metastases, commonly seen in prostate cancer and breast cancer. Here's our SPECT-CT fusing them, so we can call this a metastatic deposit uh, with quite a high degree of reliability. And here we are on the other side, sclerotic density uh, in keeping with the metastasis. Just going to show you the difference here by going back to that patient with the rib focus with, uh, with a fracture and um, callus formation around it. Now, this patient also, uh, this first patient here, also demonstrated a mass lesion here in keeping with a primary bronchogenic carcinoma, or possibly a metastasis, but much less likely. And this is just to alert you to the fact that we have to look all over the film, so or all over the SPECT-CT. So uh, the SPECT-CT is perhaps performed to identify this metastatic deposit, but we also have to look everywhere else, like the mediastine and the lungs, all the other places for any findings which you might coincidentally pick up. And that's quite important because in some conditions like prostate cancer the patient may have a very good long-term prognosis but something like a carcinoma of the lung um, might uh, uh, kill the patient within a couple of years so it's uh, extremely important to pick those up. Okay, so we're just going to finish by talking about what, by one particular um, um, pitfall that we have to um, remember when we're interpreting bone syntograms, and that's the presence of contamination of the field with urine. We mentioned that uh, radioactive urine, uh, th that the tracer is excreted through the urinary tract, and that means you can get foci of activity in the perineum because the patient may dribble a small bit of urine uh, out when they um, pass urine during the two-hour uptake period. And so you might see little foci of activity down here overlying the bone. But it's very important that we don't just consider these to be due to uh, urinary activity and that we always follow them up to clearly make sure, clearly determine that they are, whether or not they are in fact uh, metastases or not. So there's a focus of activity here just overlying the inferior pubic ramus on the right. We, we cleaned the patient's, uh, we took the patient's trousers down, uh, cleaned the area a bit with tissue and performed a repeat view and it's still there which makes us even more concerned. And the patient had a CT scan. Um, this hadn't been seen on it but there's clearly a sclerotic density here in keeping with the metastasis correlating with this area here. Just going to show you a couple more examples uh, because this is a very common cause of error. So this patient here, these foci of activity were assumed to be due to urine and um, they weren't reported as such. The patient was uh, reported as normal, no evidence of metastatic disease. The patient went on to have a CT scan and you can just see a faint area of abnormality here. 
very difficult to pick up though um, but uh, it wasn't um, it wasn't commented on the patient had uh, elevated PSA and um, the uh, clinicians were searching for the cause but it wasn't until an MRI examination was performed that the um, abnormality was detected so very important to make sure that we don't um, dismiss foci of activity in the perineal and lower pelvic regions as uh, urinary contamination. I'll show you another example here. You can see a small focus of activity just seen on the posterior view here on the right, so it doesn't necessarily have to be anterior. This patient had a urinary catheter, but you can still get small amounts of contamination, um, including when the catheter, for example, is being manipulated or perhaps emptied, something can get on the sheets. A um, view is performed with the clothing removed, the activity persisted, and a SPECT CT showed this was uptake in the ischium. Okay, so just going to make a quick have a quick discussion on another type of metastasis because up to now we've spoken on about uh, sclerotic metastases in the example we've seen, but it is possible to identify lytic metastases as well. Now, bone scintigraphy, as we mentioned at the very start, is based um, on identifying osteoblastic response. All metastases essentially are osteolytic they all cause bone destruction. The reason why some metastases appear lytic and others appear sclerotic is because of the body's response. In a very lytic metastasis, the body will um, not really exert much of a, uh, an osteoblastic response, so they can be very difficult to identify at bone scintigraphy. Sclerotic metastases are those in which the body demonstrates a very strong uh, osteoblastic response so the blastic repair process predominates and they are very hot on bone syntogram and they um, will take up uh, quite a bit of activity and they'll also appear uh, dense on CT scans. So this is a patient with renal cell carcinoma uh, who underwent bone scintigraphy and you can see a very large photopenic defect here rather like the hip replacement we saw in the last talk can also see a focal area of uptake here. But really this isn't, we, we don't see much increased activity here and that's because this is predominantly a lytic metastasis. And these are actually quite difficult to pick up often. They can be quite easily missed if they're small on uh, bone syntograms. So we generally try and avoid bone syntigraphy in patients who have tumours which are producing predominantly lytic metastases. The classic example would mean multiple myeloma. It would be much easier to perform a bone syntogram on a patient with myeloma than to perform a skeletal survey, but because of the very purely lytic nature of the bone syntogram, of the, sorry, of the myeloma, the yield from a bone syntogram is very poor. So let's look with SPECT CT at these two areas here. Here's a SPECT CT of our um, pelvic metastasis. There's a huge soft tissue mass, readily apparent in CT, but it's quite subtle on the um, SPECT CT, uh, really only with a little bit of increased activity at the margin. And of course, we, we can see it uh, because it's so large, but it's easy to see, I think, how a smaller metastasis might be missed. Now, the other lesion in the um, upper thoracic spine and the posterior elements on the right that is showing quite a bit of uptake and it just shows how it can be quite variable. Even in the same patient some metastases can show a lot of uptake and others might not show very much. So we've seen some examples of sclerotic and lytic metastases and a few fractures here and uh, I think we're going to leave it um, at that and uh, continue talking about metastases in the um, next session. Thank you.